Welcome to The Porch Online. We're so excited that you're joining us this week. If you're close enough to The Porch, we wanna invite you to come join us in person. And if you're not, we're gonna encourage you to join a local church in your community because here at The Porch, we believe gathering is extremely important because we believe that you can go fast alone, but you'll go farther together. We hope that you enjoy this week's message and learn something new about God. Well, this series is a series called The Front Porch. I'm so excited about this series because we get the opportunity to hear from other people that are sharing God's word, what they're learning from their time and studies, people that I have gotten the opportunity to know on a real deep personal level. And so I'm so excited that you're joining me and uh, the rest of our church family today. And if you're joining us online, I want to encourage you, uh, if you're close enough to come in person, we'd love to see you here. And if you're not, get a group of people together and watch online or find a local community near you because we believe here at The Porch that you can go fast alone but farther together. Well, like I said, this is a guest speaker series, um, and I'm so excited for our first speaker. Our first speaker is somebody that I lived in a two-bedroom apartment with, and I would love to say it was just the two of us, but there were six of us in the apartment. It's awesome. So we got to know each other really, really well. Really, really well, and uh, he got to hear me sing every morning when I showered at 6.30 because, you know, that's what you do when you're in a room full of other people. An incredible man of God, an incredible husband, an incredible man. I'm really privileged and honored that he said yes all the way from Crown Point, Indiana, Chicago area, Bears fan. Gross. That's the only down thing. Um, <laughs> but it's okay. We won by a lot. Um, Luke Zanstra. Come on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Love you, brother. Thank you. Yeah, I, uh, I see, I, I just see loyalty here at this church today. Um, there's a Broncos fan here today who, who the Bears, it's the only chance the Bears have this year. So um, I'm really hoping that uh, you guys, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so we're, I just figured we'd take the next 45, 50 minutes to pray for the Bears. Because, man, this is, this, is a rough, this is rough. So I'm glad. I'm, I'm guessing Cooper paid you guys to wear your jerseys. So, um, uh, yeah. So, but I'm so glad, so honored, so blessed to be with you guys. Um, you guys are dying to know who Cooper is. I have the privilege of, I, I'm guessing me and Victoria are the only two people that have got the blessing and curse to live with Cooper. <laughs> Um, and so I, I figured there's no better way for me to share um, just who Cooper is, right? I, I got to see Cooper more behind the scenes. <laughs> what a blessing that is. And so I just, uh, I want to kind of introduce myself. So I, w I went to Missions Me in 2018. So that's when, when, when me and Cooper got to meet. And I showed up and I was the man. I was 21 years old. I love Jesus more than everybody. I was going to be this great pastor. I was just this holy man of God, and I was ready to just be a blessing to everyone around me. And I show up, and I, I get to meet Cooper, who at the time was 27. Uh, we had a couple roommates. I was kind of in the middle, so I wasn't the youngest, but I wasn't the oldest. Um, and first night, we, we just, you know, we had this huge party. We're just getting to know each other. A Jesus party, not a, not a bad party, a good party. And we're getting to know each other, and we go to bed, right? And I'm like, this is awesome. Like, I can't wait to bless these guys around me. Like, I have so much wisdom and knowledge, and it's going to be awesome. And I wake up the next morning, and it was probably like 8.30. We kind of slept in. We had a late night. We slept in, and I, I wake up, and I, I open the door. And as Cooper said, we lived in a tiny two-bedroom two apartment with six guys, and Cooper was in our living room. That was where his bedroom actually was. So um, our, 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 it was our dining room area, but, but Cooper was in the middle of our lives at all times. And I, and I walk out of the door, and he's there reading his Bible. And I'm like, what is he doing? <laughs> Why is he like, what? Like, he's just trying to show off. He's just trying to show off. Next morning, same thing. I wake up. He's reading his Bible, journaling. I'm like, what is this? We'll switch. I love it. Next morning, I wake up, reading his Bible, journaling. And he did that the entire year. 
I did not. I was not as holy. I was not as good as I thought I was. So I just want you guys to know who Cooper is. Cooper is a man who loves God, who loves Jesus, has a beautiful, beautiful relationship, who shepherds, who loves. He took me in like a little brother and loved and encouraged through many times at a hot tub, we'd have conversations about things I'm struggling with and going through, and he would lead me and love me and never talk down to me, but lift me up in my brokenness. And so, guys, you have an absolute gem. You have an absolute diamond in the rough with Cooper. He's not perfect by any means, but he desires to grow. He has a beautiful relationship with Jesus, and he has an even more beautiful wife, and, and it's been such a blessing to get to know you as well, Victoria. So you guys are, are super, super blessed to have a man who I got the privilege of seeing what your pastor looks like when he's at home, and, and he, he is exactly who he's on stage behind the scenes, and, and that's rare. And so I, got, I, I truly, Cooper, you are a blessing. Thank you for, for all you've done in my life. Um, <laughs> So this morning, uh, Cooper, Cooper said, Luke, you can preach on anything, which is always the worst because you go, oh, man, what do I, what do I talk about? I, I have no idea what to talk about, right? And so I, f- I thought about fasting, you know, fasting, uh, fasting your football teams, um, fasting uh, your football team. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Please. Um, I'm, I'm fa- I think I'm going to fast the Bears this year. Um, <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm just so excited to uh, share the word. Um, I'm, I'm just going to open up a little bit of, of who I am. So I'm 26. I got married four months ago to my beautiful wife, Kayla. Um, and so marriage has been amazing. Life has been just, just a challenge. I'm, I'm just going to be real with you guys. The last year has truly been the worst year of my life. Um, had just some family situations that, that went on that were really hard. Um, I grew up with a great Christian, in a great Christian home, great Christian parents, great, great family. Um, and in the last couple of years, our, our, my family has completely separated. Um, and, and so I want you guys to know that I'm, I'm talking about this, this cave season in a place where I feel like I'm in this. I feel like I'm in this. And I don't know where you're coming today. I don't know what you're walking through but, but I can't wait to share what I just feel like God has put on my heart. So if you guys would open up to Psalm 142, the sermon title is My Only Refuge. Psalm 142. Psalm 142, verse 1, I cry aloud to the Lord. I lift up my voice to the Lord for mercy. I pour out before him my complaint. Before him I tell my trouble. When my spirit goes faint, grows faint within me, it is you who watch over my way. In the path where I walk, people have hidden a snare for me. Look and see, there is no one at my right hand. No one is concerned for me. I have no refuge. No one cares for my life. I cry to you, Lord. I say, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Listen to my cry, for I am in desperate need. Rescue me from those who pursue me, for they, also, for they are too strong for me. Set me free from my prison, that I might praise your name. Then the righteous will gather about me because of your goodness to me. Let's pray. God, we just thank you so much for your word. We thank you so much for the opportunity to just praise you this beautiful Sunday morning in Kansas City. God, that that we get to just praise you, that we get to be together as a family, as a community, Uh, of brothers and sisters in Christ. God, I pray that your word is preached today. God, that you get the glory, that you get the honor. May may it just be all about you this morning. We love you so much. We we ask for your presence. We ask that you speak to each and every one of us and that we we leave better than when we came in. We love you so much. Please help the bears. Amen. (laughs) So so this is a psalm of of David, and he's in this cave, right? He is literally in a cave. It's not, it's not a metaphor. It is serious. Cave, David is in this cave, and he's hiding from King Saul, and King Saul wants him dead. And so David is sitting in this cave on his hands and on his knees, and he's weeping, and he's crying out to God, asking, what is going on? Why is this happening to me? And he has this, these seven verses are just a cry to the Lord. 
And I want to I want to ask you just a couple questions through through this through this talk this morning. And I want to start with question number 1. What are you doing when you're alone? What are you doing when you're alone? David was alone hiding for his life. I don't know if you've ever had that where you're literally in a season where you're hiding for your life, but I know we can all relate to just hiding, hiding from our sin, hiding from our shame, hiding from our spouse, hiding from work, hiding from church, hiding from something or someone at, at, a, at any time in our life, playing hide and go seek. There's been a time in your life where you have hid. David was completely alone and had no one around him. Charles Spurgeon said this, caves make a great closet for prayer. I want us to, uh, I get the opportunity to help lead uh, the youth group where I'm from, and, and I always ask the students, guys, can we put ourselves in David's shoes? Can we go there? Can we imagine right now what it'd be like to be in a cave, to be in a place where you are scared for your life? So I want us to imagine what would it be like to be there right now in this moment Imagine the cry of David here. Life was a complete question mark. God had anointed, God had anointed David to be the future king. He was the man. David was supposed to be the special guy, the guy that killed Goliath, the, this young kid, the youngest of his family, called by God to lead the nation. And he's in a cave alone, crying out for his life. Asking God, what, where are you? What is going on? I have no one. How many of us have been there in that moment where you're asking, God, where are you? Where are my friends? Where are my family? I feel completely alone. No one's there to help me. No one's there to guide me. Just imagine, or if you can put your shoes, you can say, man, I've been there. I've been there where I'm alone, and I'm lost, and I'm broken, and it feels like I have no one. How are you praying when you're alone? Are you praying mildly because you don't want to hear your own voice? Are you praying in your head because what you're praying might be a little too risque or you don't want to say it because it's a little embarrassing? I think I can imagine, and if you guys could imagine with me, David is crying out. He's in a cave. The dude's got no one around him. I can imagine him weeping. You know, him saying like, Lord, and then you hear like the Lord, like the echo of the cave. Like I can imagine that whole conversation of him in this cave weeping and crying. How are you praying? How are you crying out to the Lord? I think so often in times and in moments of prayer and struggle in the caves, we ask the question, God, are you hearing me? And I want to say this not in, in so much a literal sense, but a boldness. If you think God isn't hearing you, speak louder. Oftentimes we can go to God and, God, I'm really struggling with, with money. We don't have enough. And you have this shame and guilt and fear, and you don't know what God's going to say. And I want to encourage you, guys, it's okay to just be a little bit bold. Like, God, I, God, I, need, I need some money right now. Bills are tight. The business isn't doing well. And if you're like, oh, I can't, God, I need you. I need you in this moment. I have no money. I have nothing. I don't know what to do. I'm working three jobs. I think that's okay to get a little bit louder and a little bit bolder. I think often in our, in our prayer life, we can be so full of shame and guilt of, oh, God, I don't want to bother you. God, I don't want to bother you. I have a boss who uh, it is a true blessing. Uh, I work for an electrician, and he is trying to buy a truck right now. And I don't know how many of you guys are trying to are in the truck market, but it's not not easy um, to find a really really nice truck for really really cheap. Those words don't go together, and that's what he's trying to do right now. And I always say, boss, 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 are you bringing God in? Are you bringing God into this? He's like, God doesn't want to be bothered with this truck. Like God doesn't want to. And I I think he'll be watching. So I'm. God wants to be a part of your truck purchase. But I don't know what you're asking God for. It could be as little as I need a truck. I want you guys to be bold in your prayer life. That's so important. David is alone. He's lost. He's broken. He's questioning God, and he's crying out. How are you crying out to God when you're in those moments? Are you full of shame and guilt, 
or are you going to go to God and just say, I'm, you're, I am all yours, God. I'm going to give you everything because I have nothing. I'm lost. There's no more tears. I can cry. There's no more questions I can ask. I just need you. I want to go on to question two. It's more of a statement than a question. Know that God knows your path. Do you think God knows your path? Do you truly think God knows your path? Again, what was David thinking in this cave? I bet Goliath came to mind. If I was David, I'd think about Goliath. I'd flex Goliath a whole lot. I killed a giant. How many of you killed a giant? I haven't killed a giant. We almost beat the Chiefs last week. That was the giant we faced. Um, anyway, um, what was he thinking in this moment? God, you anointed me king. You anointed me to rule over these people who are literally trying to kill me. I played harp for the dude that's got my head on a plaque. That's what he's hoping for. I played the harp for that dude. I had some jam worship sessions with that man, and he does not want me alive. Can you imagine that? The enemy wants you to fail. Not once in a while, not a couple times in a month. The enemy desires you to stumble daily. Cooper said a couple weeks ago, the enemy attacks not when you're at church. He, you know, the enemy's not going to come in here and try to speak lies. This is God's house, right? But the moment you walk away, the moment you get in your car, the moment you go home, that's when the devil starts speaking lies. That's where he comes in and he says, oh, no, you should look at that. Or you should put your money towards that. He, he whispers, right? He, he tries to guide us in different directions. And he's going to get you when you're weak. And in this cave season, and I don't know if you're here. I don't know if you're going to be there soon. I don't know if you just came out of it. But, but how are you going to respond in your cave season when the devil is trying to take you down? How are you going to respond when the enemy desires to take you down? He's going to be there, I promise you, telling you lies. I, my family situation the whole time, he's, man, your brother's wrong. Your dad's wrong. Your mom's wrong. Your family's wrong. There's sides. You got to pick a side. You got to pick a side. You can't, you can't do both. You have to pick a side. Don't share Jesus with them. Don't pray for them. No, 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 don't do that. No, 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 just avoid. Just avoid. Don't say anything. How many of us have walked through that? of you're dealing with something and you have no idea what to do and you think everything you do is going to be a wrong decision, whether you do this or that. You're like, God, I, I keep losing. I keep losing. Whether I do this or whether do I do this, I lose. And, and David shows this perfect example. David was just on his knees right now in brokenness and shame and guilt. And he was wondering, God, where are you? I think so often our brains can say, we need to do something. And God's just saying, come to me. Come to me in this moment, because nothing else will suffice. In this season, I was engaged, um, and I, I couldn't go to my wife. I, I didn't want her to deal with my struggles. I wanted her to really like me, and I wanted her to marry me, so I didn't want to bring her down and tell her that I'm struggling, that I'm going through. Like, that's the enemy, right? The enemy is going to say, don't share, don't like, don't, don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody. Who are you inviting in when you're facing something dark? Who are you inviting into your life when you're facing something dark? Often, and I can speak for, for men, oftentimes we go, oh, I got this. I don't need anybody. Pastor Cooper doesn't know what I'm going through. I just met Pastor Cooper. He doesn't know anything. I know way more than him. Leaders of the church, ah, oh, no, I don't want them. I don't like Broncos fans. I don't like Chiefs fans. I'm a Bears fan. I got no one to go to. <laughs> Who are you inviting in when you're on your knees? I think that's so important. Cooper and I were, were talking yesterday and the importance of having a close group of, of people around you that you can open up, that you can share everything with, how important that is to have people that you can go to and just say, Man, Cooper, I'm str I just need prayer. I have no idea what to tell you. I, have no, I, I, I don't even know what to ask you. Can you just pray for me? Cooper's not going to be like, sounds like a personal problem to you, bro. 
go Chiefs. And then he hangs up. Like, no, he's like, yes, I'll pray for you. Whatever you need, whatever you need, Cooper is there for me. And I ask, who is in your circle? Who's in your corner? It says, for they are stronger than I. At at a time in our lives, we're all going to think we're Superman. At a time in our lives, we're all going to think we can do it alone. I promise you, you are not. You are full of sin. You are full of brokenness. But we all needed something, right? We needed that because the day you were born was the moment you were born. You were born of sin and shame and brokenness and guilt. And you're going to keep failing and keep suffering and keep falling down. It's just going to be a snowball effect, right? But then Jesus comes in. And 2,000 years ago, he died. He died on that cross for you, for me. He had, he had your name in his mind on that cross. He came to wash us white as snow. We need to understand in this cave season, if you're in it, if you're walking through it, if, if you see it coming, you need to understand the enemy is going to try everything to cut you down, to stop you, to say, don't go that way, don't go to church, don't go to small groups, don't go to youth group. He's going to do everything in his power to stop you. I want you guys to know how, how truly powerful this is right here. To have a church, to have a community, to have a blessing. To, to, I'm guessing most of you know each other. That's special. That's unique. Enjoy these moments where you have a church that you get to know everyone. Like, this is a family. I got to watch you guys, the, the, the sound team and the worship team, just talk, and, and Cooper's running around. And you guys are just a family. Like, I just got that feeling right away of this is a family. Families go through the best of moments together, and they go through the worst of moments together. Please, please, please hear this. Don't go through trials alone. Invite people in. And I'm not asking you to come forward and say, I'm John Smith, and I'm struggling with this. Please pray for me. That's not at all. Please, please don't do that. But I encourage you, if you have a friend, a family member, a brother, a sister, mom, dad, grandpa, grandma, someone in your life, go to when you are in this cave season, when you're alone and you're broken, invite someone in. And the third question I have, where is your refuge? Where are you going when life stinks? Where are you literally going? I know oftentimes I like to, um, Kayla usually works later than I, and in my alone time, I like to either, either go in the bedroom or on the couch, and I just don't want anyone to bother me. In my brokenness, I just want, please don't text me, don't call me, I'm going through it. Don't bother me. Where do you go when you're struggling? If you're, strugg- if you're like, man, like, I-, I might not be in a cave, but I'm struggling with this sin. Where do you go when that, when that whisper of, hey, you should do that? Where do you go immediately? We all go somewhere. We all respond in some way, right? When we get hungry, where do you go? Go to the kitchen. When you're tired, where do you go? The couch or bed. When you have to go to the bathroom, where do you go? Go to the bathroom, right? When you go places, yeah, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, I, please go to the bathroom when you have to go to the bathroom. Um, but see, where do you go? When that sin, when that struggle, when that brokenness, when you're like, man, I'm struggling with this sin, where are you going? Where are your feet taking you? You know, if you're struggling with lust, do you go in that bedroom? Do you shut the door quietly? I hope no one comes home. I hope, I hope nothing happens. If you're struggling with money, do you go out and spend money? I know I've done that a couple of times. You don't have money, so you're like, I'm going to make it up by going and spending money. It doesn't make sense, right? That's the enemy. He's saying, you should do the opposite of what you actually should do.
What are you putting in your life when you're in the cave? Where do you go? Do you watch Chief Highlights? There's a lot of them. <laughs> Not a lot of bears, I know. <laughs> Where do you, what do you bring in? Do you, do you have your phone? Do you get home and, and you have kids and ah, I don't want to deal with my, my kids. I don't want to deal with my wife, my wife right now. And you just go in the bathroom. I know I've done that. Lock the door, sit on, sit on the toilet for way too long <laughs> just because I know no one's going to bother me in there. What are you bringing in? Are you watching a movie? Are you watching a TV show? Are you watching highlights of the Chiefs? Are you looking up your fantasy team and how they're doing and who you need to trade and who you need to pick up? What are you bringing into your life in the cave season? I think the most important thing, guys, we can bring into that alone season is, is, is the holy book. Opening that up. Saying, God, what do you have to say to me? What do you have to say to me? And I think so often I've asked God that question. God, what, do you ha- what can you say to me through this? And oftentimes God won't say, you know what, Luke? You need to go to Genesis 34 verse 12, and that will heal every issue you have in your life. No, just open it. Just open it and start reading. Open it and start asking questions. God, you know, David, we can read Psalm 142. David's in this cave. Why is he in this cave? He's the king. He's the rightful king. He's the guy that killed Goliath. Why is he there? But yet so often in our brokenness, in our shame, in our sin, we bring things that distract us from anything from God because it's easier. You know, you go on your phone. How many of you guys have been on your phone and two hours goes by and it feels like 15 minutes? Who's been there, right? It's like, what, what just happened? Like the sun set. What, when did that happen? You know, like it was just noon and now it's 730. What, what happened? What are you bringing in in your brokenness and your shame? Do you know when you're weak? Do you know when you're weak? David knew he was weak. He says this, I'm weak. I'm being attacked. The enemy wants me. My friends seem like they want me dead. The king wants me dead. It seems like everybody wants my head. Again, I can speak for the men in this room. I know so often I'm, I'm not weak. I don't need anybody. I don't need the Bible. I don't need to pray. I get real cocky when I'm, when I'm broken, when I'm lost. I think I got it all in control. I think I got it all figured out. When I truly don't, I have no idea what's going on. But yet I want everybody to think that I have my life all put together. I put on a smile. I put on a laugh. <laughs> and I make it seem like I'm doing great. Life's great. Marriage is great. We bought a house. Buying a house is great. We, we have all these things, right? You put on this face of, life's great. It's great. It's great. It's good. Yeah, it's good. It's good. It's good. And you walk away, and you're like, man, my life is horrible. My marriage is in shambles. I don't have a relationship with one of my kids or multiple kids. I'm struggling with this sin, and I have no idea where to go or what to do. But I want you guys to know in this story, in this verse, in these verses, David was fighting. David was fighting in this moment. David, this incredible swordsman, this incredible leader could get an army. Like how many times did David just win, just wipe out nations, right? We hear that. We hear that so often of David was this great king, this great, he was awesome at fighting. He was awesome at being this leader. He was a great general. He was the man. And you look at him and he's weeping in a cave. Now imagine you're outside the cave and you walk up and you hear a guy crying and you're like, you you good in there, sir? And he stands up and it's David. And you're like, David? The David? The dude that killed Goliath, right? Like the big guy, like 10-foot dude you, with a sling, like that was you? And you're crying in a cave. What are you doing crying in a cave? What are you doing crying in a cave? 
And I can't say this for sure, but I can just imagine David saying, man, I'm fighting right now. I'm fighting for my life. I'm fighting for my brokenness. I'm fighting for my sin. I'm fighting for my shame. David was fighting in the caves with shouts of prayer and of weeping. I don't know where you're at today, but maybe some of, some of you need to go in a closet, in a spare room, maybe to a coffee shop, and you just need to lose it. Just absolutely lose it. Put your, put, don't care about anything else and just say, God, I'm sick of this face. I'm sick. My teeth hurt from smiling so much. My heart hurts from lying and telling everybody I'm good and I'm not struggling. Man, I think it's, there's something special when you go to God and you're like, God, I'm, I'm on E. I got nothing left to give you. My tank is complete. Like, I can't even get a drop out. I got nothing. I am in absolute shambles right now, and the only thing that seems to help is you. And so, God, please, just, just help me. Just help me. Just let me feel a little bit. Just fill my cup, just a couple drops, please, because I am empty, and I'm lost, and I'm trying to figure out this thing called life. Be bold enough to speak loudly in your prayer life, to say, God, I'm struggling with, with whatever you're going through. Please, God already knows, right? God already knows what's going on in here. He already knows that sin. He already knows that dark spot in your heart that you don't want anyone to know. He knows, but he's waiting for you to come before him and say, God, I am struggling. God, I'm, I, got, I got nothing for you. I'm struggling with money. I'm, I, I need more money. I need more money. I, I don't want to tithe anymore. I got to take that out because I need to feed me and my family and my kids and my grandma and grandpa. And, and, and God, I, I, can't, I can't do this no more. I'm broken. I'm lost. God, please help me. I want to challenge you. Fight with prayer. Fight with prayer, not with not with gossip, not with, you know what, I'm just going to, you know, I'm going to go drink. I'm going to go to the bar, have a couple drinks. I'm going to go on my phone for a little bit, look up some websites I probably shouldn't be on. I'm going to go eat a lot of food. I'm going to go to McDonald's, get a couple Big Macs, a couple fries, and just eat my sorrows away. That's so often what we do, right? in our brokenness, in our shame. We try to find something that's gonna fill our God-sized heart, and I promise you, it, it doesn't fill it. You're gonna have a moment of, oh, that was great, that was awesome, I enjoyed it. That Big Mac was awesome. Fries were crispy. But 15 minutes later, you're gonna feel shame. Man, I didn't need that. I didn't need to eat, I wasn't even that hungry. Man, I didn't need to go to that website. I have a, I have a husband, I have a wife, I have a family. I'm in high school. I got friends. I got family. And you guys don't need to go to those websites. You don't need to go out to eat. You don't need to drink from the bottle. Man, you, you need to drink from this right here. It's the best drink you can take a drink from. It's a well that never runs dry. I promise you it doesn't. In 26 years, and I'm guessing a lot of you can say the same thing, in 26 years of me being a Christian, not 26, like 10, but I grew up in the church, but I haven't, I haven't got sick of this yet. I'm not tired of this. I've noticed that every time, even when I know, right, you know, you know what to do. You know to go to God. You know, right? We all know. When we go to God, when we go to his word, and we open it, we say, God, what do you have for me? And you open a psalm like 142, that you see a man who is honest and open and saying, God, I am lost. Someone is out for my head. I have no idea what to do. David can relate to you in a lot of ways. David can understand what you are going through. So never, I want you guys to know this, never feel like you're the only person who's gone through that because you're not. You are not the only one. The enemy's gonna come in and say, you're the only one that's going through that. You're the only one that's doing that. You're really bad. You're not, you're not doing good. But man, invite people in. And so I wanna leave you guys with three things to do in your cave and darkness season. Number one, pray with no distractions. 
pray with no distractions. Please put your phone away. Put your phone away. Our minds tell us, man, there's, there might be an emergency. There might be, what if, uh, what if Cooper needs me? What if, what if Kayla needs me? What if something bad happens at work? We think we're in control, but we're not. Guys, put your phone away. Please walk into a place that's, that's safe. If you have a prayer closet, please go in there. If you have a room that you're comfortable in, go there. If you have a living room, go there. Put your phone away. Put your, put your phone in the other room. Turn the TV off. Put the remotes away. Pray with no distractions. Number two, invite people in that want God's path for your life. So yes, pray. I want you guys to go pray. Pray immediately. Bring God in. But next, I want you guys to, to say, all right, God, who's someone I can go to? Who is someone that I can open my heart to that won't gossip, that won't share, that will keep it safe between me, him, and God? I urge you, don't just go to the, next per- the first person you think of. If you have an amazing spouse, I've, I've often just shared, poured my heart out to my wife. And she's been there, and we get to pray and love, and she always says the right thing, it seems. And even if she doesn't say the right thing, she points me back to Jesus. And that's, that's the people you need to invite in, the people that point you back to Jesus. Not the people that are like, I know how to fix all your problems. Thank you for coming to me because of how wise and awesome I am. Those are not the people you should go to. And number three, find a safe place to open up about your cave season. Find a safe place. Kayla and I bought a house with foundation issues, and our foundations have cracks all along the four walls, and we had to dig out our house around the four walls to push them out, seal it up with some tar on the outside, and put some ins- insulation in. And, and I got the privilege to do that. I have a boss who has equipment, and, and I got to do that. And my house literally looked like we were building a trench, and we had mounds of dirt on all four sides. And Kayla and I, we, we'd come home, and it'd just be ugly. You walk home, and you're like, I... I want to just go back to my parents' house. Like, let's just get a hotel. It's so much better. Like, we don't have gas right now. Uh, our dryer, our, our washer, we're not using those. I haven't taken, uh, I haven't taken a warm shower in like a month and a half. Um, so I, I didn't want, my house was not a safe place for me. So don't think, oh, my house is a safe place. If it's not a safe place, don't go there. I didn't want to be at my house. We got the walls filled in, and it's awesome now, and it's sweet. So now I'm like, oh, finally, I got a safe place again. But find a safe place to go. Find a safe place, a quiet place with no distractions, phone away, TV away. Buffalo Wild Wings is not the answer. There's way too many TVs going on. I want to close with this. Seasons can be beautiful and bright. And they can also be lonely and dark. But I promise you, Jesus wants to walk with you through both. I want to say that again. Jesus desires to walk alongside you through both. Let's pray. God, we just thank you so much for this day. We thank you so much for your word, for David's story a man that went through so much hurt and harm and brokenness. God, a man you said you're going to be king one day. And David's writing this. He's, he's on his hands. He's on his knees. And he's weeping out. He's saying, God, what is going on? God, I pray for the people right now in this room that are, that are in that place right now. I want us to just be bold in this moment. If you're, if you're like, man, I am in that cave. I am in that cave. I got no one around me. I'm lost. I am so full of sin and shame and brokenness. 
if you resonated with anything I said today and you're like, man, I just need prayer. I honestly, I don't feel comfortable sharing right now. I don't want to open up yet. I'm trying to figure this out. Man, I would love if, if, if you feel like you're, man, I'm in that place right now. Would you raise your hand? Would you raise your hand and just raise it boldly? Just know that it's okay to be in that season. You can put your hands down. You are seen and you are loved. God, I pray for those people right now in Jesus' mighty name, that you are in that cave, that you are alone, that you are fighting, that you're getting to the point where you're saying, God, I'm tired. I got nothing left. And God's saying, I have an endless well. I have an endless well that I desire to give you. God, we ask for that right now in Jesus' mighty name. May your well fill us up. May your well fill us up. God, I desire that for this church, for this area, for this season of this church. God, may, may you just fill them up with your well. I thank you so much for moments like these, God, when you just show up. I pray that in, in the next weeks and months and years, God, that, that we can look back at, at Psalm 142 and be reminded that David walked through life that was hard, and he was trying to figure this out. And he invited God, and God, may we do the same. May we be encouraged by your word, by your Holy Spirit. May we be guided by him. God, I pray just a blessing over Cooper and Victoria, God, as they have moved this week into a new house. They are in a new season of life of pastoring a church. God, I just lift them up right now in Jesus' mighty name. I pray that Cooper can be a pastor who is a shepherd that leads from, from the back, that leads well and leads by your spirit, God, that his opinions, that his, his desires, God, can be your desires. God, I pray for this church, this beautiful, amazing church. I pray for this congregation. I pray for the people watching online that if they ever, God, if they ever go through a cave season or a cave, even a cave day, a cave week, a month, a cave season, God, I pray right now in the mighty name of Jesus that they are reminded of Psalm 142, not of anything I said, God, but everything that you said today. God, that they are reminded to just put distractions away. We just give you all the honor, all the glory today. We love you so much. In your holy and precious name we pray, amen. What an incredible message. And <clears throat> while we're here in this moment, still in a prayerful attitude, Luke talked about our brokenness and, and the pain that we feel in that God-sized hole that we try and fill with different things. And if you're in this room today and you don't know Jesus and you have nowhere to go, and the things that he mentioned, like food and websites and different things, and, and your life has been in this way that... You just don't know Jesus, and you need to know Jesus. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm going to give you an opportunity to just quietly, where you're sitting, to invite Jesus to come into your life. So that when you do go through these cave seasons, you have a place to go to that is a refuge, that is a, a strong tower. And the Bible tells us that in my weakness, and David knew this even before, but in my weakness, I am made strong because of Jesus. If you're in this room today and you want to know Jesus intimately and you want to have a place to go, you want to have that refuge through the storm, and that's you in this room, I'm going to give you a count of three and have you raise your hand. The hand raise is not magical. It's not special. But you acknowledging Jesus, the Bible says that if I confess with my mouth and believe in my heart that Christ is Lord, then I shall be saved. Then you shall be saved. If that's you in this room today, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. One, two, three. I see your hand. Lord, thank you for life change today. Thank you for an incredible word. And I pray for the people who raise their hand in this room today. God, I pray that their lives would be impacted by you. That we know that we're a new creation. As Luke said, we are made white as snow, that our transgressions are gone, that we aren't, we aren't these, these uh, uh, broken and sinful things that we were before, but we are a new creation, that it's no longer I who live, but, or you who live in me. 
that we're a new creation. We can walk in wholeness and peace and joy. And when those seasons and those storms come, like Luke said, we don't have to feel shame and guilt. We can come boldly and confidently to the throne of grace, like it says in Hebrews, in those seasons. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity. We praise you. It's in your mighty name we pray. If you just prayed or have any questions at all, feel free to let us know.